the Community Development Committee of Metropolitan Council for August 6th, 2018. First item, members, is to approve our agenda. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, our agenda is adopted. Next is our approval of our July 16th minutes. Is there a motion? Mr. Chair, I would move approval with one small change okay. which I already sent to Michelle. So Councilmember Wolf. It. It's on page two where it says, Councilmember Wolf commented the amount the counties and cities are paying is unfortunately due to regional parks are considered equivalent to state parks, which didn't make any sense. So I suggested that instead it say, Council Wolf commented that counties and cities are paying nearly all the cost of regional parks with local dollars. Although regional parks are considered the functional equivalent to state parks, they have not been receiving the 40% state share of funding that is laid out in Minnesota law. Okay, that's good, I think. Um... There's a motion with a change. Is there a second, I presume? Mr. Chair, I second as amended. Okay, it's been seconded. Discussion to the motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? The minutes are adopted. Thank you, Councilmember Wolf, for that clarification. Next is our business agenda. Our first item is 2018 206, City of Minneapolis Malcolm Yards Comprehensive Plan Amendment. Mike Larson is here to present this item. Good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Michael Larson, Senior Planner and Local Planning Assistance. The City of Minneapolis um, has submitted the uh, Malcolm Yards Comprehensive Plan Amendment uh, for council review. Uh, as seen in uh, figure one of your staff report, Thrive MSB 2040 gives the City of Minneapolis community designation of urban center. The area affected by the amendment is shown uh, in red on the screen in the southeast part of Minneapolis. As shown in figure two of your staff report, uh, this map shows regional systems in relationship to the amendment site, which includes the Metro Green Line and its Prospect Park Station near the amendment location. The amendment uh, removes 9.44 acres from the southeast Minneapolis or semi-industrial employment district a uh, policy designation that the city uses to express its long-term support for industrial uses. The amendment then further reguides the property from industrial to category called transitional industrial. The project associated with the amendment has two phases and could total as many as 800 dwelling units with 80,000 square feet of commercial space. <coughs> As shown in figure three of your staff report, the amendment reguides land from uh, industrial, uh, shown in darker purple to trend the transitional industrial, the lighter purple, uh, adjacent to an area along University Avenue that's guided as mixed use, shown in that same in color that you see in a contiguous area. Transitional industrial is a guiding land use in areas where the city supports continued industrial use, but where there may be long-term uh, transition to other uses because of market demand, as well as uh, broader reuse and redevelopment potential in the area or in the buildings. Uh, in the case of the project associated with the amendment, uh, there are two phases, uh, but the timeline for the second phase is uh, it's uncertain at this time. In our review, we looked at the density of the proposed project against requirements related uh, to density uh, near transit in the transportation policy plan. Uh, of those reasons, these requirements were be uh, applied and analyzed more broadly uh, with a full 2040 comp plan update. We've determined that the project contributes to the minimum that it will be required near transit way stations for areas that are guided for redevelopment such as this. In urban center communities, uh, uh, that figure is 50, 50 dwelling units an acre at a minimum. As currently proposed, uh, uh, the project itself would be 79 dwelling units an acre. We've determined that the amendment does not impact the potential future alignment of the Grand Browns Missing Link. It's currently the status as a search corridor in the uh, Regional Parks and Policy Plan. Uh, we've communicated uh, with the City of Minneapolis regarding their recent growth, uh, and they've committed to working with us uh, to adjust their forecasts as part of their 2040 plan update. Uh, Minneapolis has already surpassed its 2020 forecasts. Our 2017 population estimate for Minneapolis's 
423,990, while our 2020, 2020 forecast is 423,300. We found that the uh, amendment is otherwise consistent with uh, council policies and that uh, it's compatible with the plans for adjacent jurisdictions. Uh, therefore, the proposed action for you today is to adopt the uh, review attached review record and allow the city of Minneapolis to place the Malcolm Yards comprehensive plan amendment into effect. Uh, to advise the city to work with the council to determine an updated forecast for its 2440 comprehensive plan update that incorporates the stronger than forecasted market demand and changes in guiding land use, such as what you see today. Uh, further advise the city that the council requires the incorporation of density ranges into its land use policy to determine conformance and consistency with Thrive MSP 2040, the 2040 Transportation Policy Plan, and the 2040 Housing Plan. As explained in the staff report, current city policy includes a combination of policy features which have density ranges and guiding land uses. The guiding land use transitional industrial does not have a guiding density per se for it to be counted towards meeting forecasts and part of land supply for affordable housing. The council will require a specific density range and that will be that's part of our recommended uh, advisory comments. And finally, uh, to uh, advise the city to implement the com additional advisory comments in the review record for forecasts, land use, and housing. And Mr. Chair, that concludes my presentation. Thank you for the presentation. Are there questions for staff? Mr. Chair, I move this item. Okay, it's been moved. A second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there a discussion of the motion? Councilman Ramon. Mr. Chair, I, I support the motion because the land use changes for the Malcolm Yards um, supports the Tower Side Innovation District, which um, will be catalytic for good TOD throughout the region. Agreed. Thank you very much. Other discussion for the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Our next item is consideration of 2018-207, the City of Plymouth Greenway North Comprehensive Plan Amendment. Jake Riley is here to present. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Connors, uh, Council Members. Thank you. I'm Jake Riley. I'm a sector rep um, and senior planner with Local Planning Assistance. Um, you have before you the City of Plymouth Greenway North Comprehensive Plan Amendment. Uh, as you can see in figure two, figure one of your staff report, uh, Thrive MST 2040 gives the city of Plymouth a community designation of suburban edge. The area affected by the amendment is shown in red. And then sh as shown in figure two of your staff report, um, this is the site in re relationship with the regional systems. Um, the amendment itself is uh, reguiding five parcels totaling nearly 25 acres from living area rural two to living area two. The site is currently vacant and it propo the proposal facilitates the development of a residential subdivision with lots for 20 new single family homes and 103 townhomes, totaling 123 housing units. And that's part of why this item is before the CDC today because it um, creates more than 100 housing units. Um, the existing and proposed plan land use are here in front of you currently. Um, it's guided for lower density, um, a housing development and they're going to be accommodating this higher density development. Um, it's, uh, as I said, it's currently vacant and council staff discussed Plymouth's recent growth with the city of Plymouth staff um, and forecasts will be adjusted when the city submits its 2040 comprehensive plan um, update to us. So the findings that the committee has in front of it today are that the proposed amendment conforms to plans for regional systems. It's consistent with regional policy, including Thrive, and is compatible with the plans of adjacent and affected jurisdictions. And your proposed action today is that the Metropolitan Council adopt the attached review record and allow the City of Plymouth to place the Greenway North Comprehensive Plan Amendment into effect. Find that there are forecast adjustments associated with the development proposal, which will be authorized with the upcoming 2040 plan update for agreement with the city, and advise the city to implement the advisory comments in the review record for forecasts and housing, which address um, the recent growth 
and the de development in the city. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you for the presentation. Are there questions about the presentation? Okay, I entertain a motion in that case. Move approval. Second. And moved and seconded. Discussion to the motion. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, that concludes our business agenda. Um, we've got four information items, and the first is a report from the Land Use Advisory Committee. I wanted to um, take this periodic opportunity to just give you an update on the last couple of LUAC meetings um, and the content that the members have have covered. Um, in our May item, as you see in the in the report uh, attached to your your package, we spent a fair amount of time looking at the, the update for the Regional Parks Policy Plan, talking in some detail about uh, community engagement um, and regional balance. We also had, I think, a, a productive conversation about um, equity at the council, um, and we got into a piece published in the Star Tribune, um, I think, uh, asking questions about the um, uh, the, the work underway at the council, and I think we had a good discussion about that. Um, Angela Torres and uh, C. Terrence Anderson, who presented that piece, followed up to LUAC members with a pretty substantive response, um, really calling out the uh, the range of activities underway um, uh, at the council and uh, how that reflects uh, goals established and thrive. And then we also had um, some discussion about mixed income um, housing in the region. In our July uh, meeting, we continued a sort of a, a series of ongoing threads. One is looking at uh, comprehensive plans and emerging themes that we're seeing sort of from the um, local settings and how those can be understood in, in themes or in patterns. And I think that that's um, an ongoing area of interest for the LUAC members. Um, we also had a, the first of um, two presentations on the report that I mentioned in at the last council meeting, a typology of change in suburban neighborhoods. Um, that was very interesting, I think, for LUAC members to, to see um, that research work calling out, um, you know, at a fairly fine grain dynamics that are playing out across the region and understanding those I think in a fairly nuanced way. So that was really um, well received. And then we also uh, had a discussion about the um, update of the, the TOD guide um, uh, that's been in development by Deb Dietrich and Michael Larson uh, and, and others talking specifically about case studies across, across the region. I think that was also really well received. And then finally, uh, another theme that the Land Use Advisory Committee has been developing over a period of time is this question of how do local economic development activities fit into a larger context and how can local leaders kind of maximize that connection and also understanding for their own elected bodies, you know, how does the work that we're doing at our local scale fit into this larger, um, not only set of, of dynamics, but also the, the larger agenda that's um, that's regionally set by Greater MSP and others. And so this economic indicator dashboard is, I think, a step in that direction, thinking about, um, you know, how can local leaders really maximize that impact and also uh, align their local activities to the max, the maximum degree with, uh, with local conditions and local initiatives. So that gives you a sense about um, our, our work. We've got... Uh, you know, a fairly robust um, work plan for 2018. So we just met to talk about how we um, finish in November, finish the uh, the year in a very strong position. And um, I think uh, I think it will have been a very productive year for the, the Lou app. So be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. Councilman Wolf. Thank you. Not a question so much as a comment. I found the economic indicator dashboard PowerPoint fascinating, mm. um, especially when I looked at the slide about how far uh, employers have to look to find their workers 
and was surprised to see Apple Valley and Lakeville as number one and number two as the people, the places where people are coming from less far away than the metro. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah. I, I think it's a, a, a strength of this kind of work is to disrupt our expectations in some way. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. Well, I'm happy to talk offline or answer other questions that you might have as you as you consider um, this material or otherwise, and uh, look forward to finishing out out the year. So, um, let's move on to our our next information item: an update on requests for extensions. And Lisa Brahas will be presenting on this item for the 2018 Comprehensive Plan Update cycle. Good afternoon, committee. So long awaited, I think. Earlier this year, you had uh, granted staff authorization to um, open up a deadline, or I'm sorry, uh, application period to extend the 2018 deadline for comprehensive plan updates for up to a year. So I'm going to walk through where we're at today as far as overall planning process and then how many applications we got and what our new timeline will look for, for or look like for those applications. So today we have um, well, just so you know, while we have 187 communities in the metro area, we will receive 167 plans. Uh, Carver County and Scott County have planning authority for the townships within their jurisdiction, so we get one plan for a very large geography for each of those counties. So 167 plans that we will be um, reviewing over the next couple of years. Um, so far, we have received 73 preliminary plans. So 73 different communities have sent us a draft version of their plan so far, which is quite a bit further ahead than we have been in the last cycle. Last cycle, we did not have a formalized preliminary plan review process. We actually called them informal reviews and by word of mouth made it available. And we, because we didn't formally track them, we are estimating we got about 40 to 50 plans in the last cycle in their draft form. Um, and the 2008 cycle communities really um, identified that informal review as being immensely valuable to them. And as staff, we also found it valuable because we got an early look at plans before they had gone through the official approval process from their local governments to help make sure they were covering everything they needed to cover. They were um, not missing items and that we also were able to identify fairly early on any potential conformance issues. So we had time without a review clock ticking to work out those issues and make sure they were rectified before we received them officially for review. So at this point, um, having more than half of our, or not quite half of our plans submitted for preliminary review has put us in a fairly good position. We feel comfortable with where we're at and we still have um, about two months left um, in our cycle for reviewing additional preliminary plans. So through the end of September is our current deadline for preliminary plans to be submitted. Um, so far we have received seven plans officially for their um, review. Um, and as a body, governing body, you folks have officially authorized three of those plans to be adopted. We have one more queued up for the end of this month. The city of Medina will be coming before you at your next CDC meeting. Um, and we have another one that we're scheduling, I believe for September, the city of Landfall. So we're keeping away slowly but surely and as many as we can um, move through our cycle before this deadline at the end of the year it makes staff feel a little more comfortable um, as we get in, uh, as we near the end of this last quarter. Mr. Chair. Yes. Okay. Councilman Let me Dorfman. just ask you, since you've got that slide up. Mm -hmm. So, of the seven, 73 preliminary plans, mm -hmm. um, a couple of questions. One, what's your sense of sort of what sort of shape are they in? Are they taking lots and lots of work uh -huh. from the council, or are they almost ready to go? And then, as you review them, are you getting them back? You're not waiting and sending them back all in one swoop. You're sending them back as you finish reviewing them, right? Sure. Okay. Mr. Chair, um, Councilmember Dorfman, to your last question, um, we review those plans as we get them, so we don't just hold off on them, um, partly because I think it'd be a little hair pulling for our staff to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but we do try to re um, get our draft comments back to communities within uh, 30 to 45 days. As we've gotten a big 
a peak of them, a big wave of them have come in um, in May and June. It's been a little harder to meet that 45 days, but we're still pushing for that to get those comments out because we want them to be timely and useful. Um, I will talk a little bit more at the end of this presentation about some themes we've seen, so things that we talked about with our Land Use, land use Advisory Committee. But um, overall, I would say most plans are in really good shape. There are some common themes around things that have been missing. Um, and so we've seen that across the board and we'll be communicating with other um, communities that haven't maybe finished up their plans yet, that these are things that we commonly see. Um, part of that is um, some specific requirements around inflow and infiltration that we like to see in plans, mapping specific elements. So more technical pieces than kind of overall themes. Um, a very positive note is that we've had very few conformance issues out of the 73 plans, and most of the issues that might rise to the level of conformance so far have really been um, inadvertent errors, misnaming things, or implying that they may have funding when they don't. So not to the point where they would actually have a substantial impact on a regional system, per se. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So this is a map of communities that have submitted their plan so far. Um, we've had five counties, those that are outlined in orange have submitted their plans for review. This is actually outside of what we had expected in the last several cycles. Counties have been the last of the communities to submit their plans, mostly because they like to wait to see where cities are at in their planning process as um, counties are responsible for transportation planning within their jurisdictions, county roads, county highways. Um, counties like to see where growth is gonna be allocated so they can appropriately um, plan for the transportation system to support that. In this cycle, we've seen counties working uh, more proactively with the communities along the way with the cities within their jurisdiction so that they're um, moving along with them and um, developing their plans uh, right alongside uh, the, the city planning process as well. So five of those plans have been uh, submitted for preliminary review. Um, we've had 53 cities submit plans as well and 16 townships in the metro. So you see Dakota County covers most of the townships that have submitted plans, but a handful in Washington County as well have submitted those. The Dakota County Collaborative was one of the communities that was eligible and received grant funding, and that's how those townships work together to hire a consultant to help them get their planning process done. Most of them are agricultural, are, are agricultural in nature, and working together because they have a lot of shared issues has been a really effective way for them to facilitate their planning process, and they've done that in a couple cycles now. Um, you can see on this map, too, that there are communities um, marked in Hatch that have also um, submitted their official plans. So we've had only a handful that have done that switch from both preliminary to official plans so far. Um, but obviously, as we go through, we'll see more of those um, being covered. So just a reminder, earlier this year, the council authorized staff to administer administratively review and approve extension requests that community submitted. We had an application period open in January through the end of May, and communities could request up to one additional year um, in the planning process, so up to December 31st of 2019. Um, and as a note that a change or a granted extension to the overall comp plan deadline does not change other deadlines associated with planning for the Mississippi River uh, critical corridor area, uh, surface water management plan uh, deadlines, or water supply planning deadlines. In all three of those cases, those uh, three particular components of local plans are actually approved by um, other agencies. So the critical area and water supply plans are actually approved by um, Minnesota DNR. Surface water plans are approved by the local, juris uh, local watershed districts that have jurisdiction within a community whereas they are a required element of a comprehensive plan, the council does not have approval authority over those elements. Um, in application materials, communities, um, as part of the request and as required by statute, really have a simple application process, um, passing a local government resolution for the request and submitting a work plan that details uh, what uh, remains to be done and then the timeline for completion of those items. 
So um, in this cycle, we received 46 um, total applications for extensions, and 37 of those extensions were to a date in the first half of 2019, um, with nine of those extensions falling in the second half of the year, really from September to the end of the year. Five of those extension requests were for a full year to complete that, um, to complete local plans and get them to the council for review. This is compared to the 2008 cycle, where we had over 61, I believe it was 61 um, applications that would go through uh, the first half of the year, and another nine that would uh, that requested extension through the end of 2009 in that particular cycle. So our as we're talking with uh, local planning assistant staff about the work we've been doing to prepare for this planning cycle and to facilitate the update of 2040 comprehensive plans, one of our goals was really to help communities get their plans in on time and to have complete um, and to have complete plans as part of that. So the preliminary plan process meant to help that completeness item, and all of the training and. Um, elements that are included in local planning, uh, the local planning handbook and in the planet training series really help to shorten up the timelines that communities are requesting. So we did see fewer requests. We hope that's indicative of more communities being on time with the planning process. Um, so we will see at, when we do our closeout at the end of this cycle, uh, at the end of 2019 and beginning of 2020, if we've met those goals, but so far it appears that we're at least on track to meeting that goal. So you can see communities that have requested extensions are scattered around the region. Some of these communities um, have submitted preliminary plans for review, but expect to continue to do a lot of work um, over uh, or past the 2018 deadline, and so have requested additional time. You can see that distribution by district there too. So most of the communities requesting extension are in district 12, but most of those communities are requesting, requesting only a short amount of additional time. So falling in the first half of the year and not too much additional time. So relatively uh, distributed, uh, district four follows behind that, but mostly because those are smaller communities out in Carver County, um, excuse me, that have, uh, either uh, are very, have very small uh, amount of staff on hand to work on this and are working with, um, usually with a small consulting group to, to help them complete their plans. Uh, of note is that the, we did not have any counties requesting an extension, which is different than in the last cycle where I believe nearly every county either requested an extension or came in after the 2018 deadline regardless. So this is how the distribution of plan requests looks like for our timeline. The left hand side of your screen is January 1st of 2019 and the right hand side of that chart is December 31st of 2019. Um, you can see um, each dot represents one community. I didn't include names of communities on here, it would have been illegible. I did try, <laughs> but it wouldn't have worked out well. But you can see, um, meant to illustrate here, that most of the communities are requesting even extensions just to um, the first three months of the year, right before April. Um, there's quite a bit of a cluster there. Um, and even a community who wanted to be sure that they just had a little bit of time into January, just to be sure they got all their uh, T's crossed and their I's dotted before they hit the send button on the online submittal. Um, but we see some falling right there in that second quarter as well. And then a big drop off until September and then um, that whole clump at the end, like I had noted, the additional five communities at the end here. Some communities are requesting more time than they expect to need say an additional couple weeks or a month or so, just to be sure that they have um, a, t a little bit of time post um, action by their official body to pull together all the materials and actually get them um, in the right format to send to the council and making sure there aren't any additional items that their local governing body may request that they add or change at the last minute before forwarding it to us. So um, while this is what that extended timeline looks like, there might be some wiggle room within that, hopefully a little bit earlier on some of those. So overall, communities have cited a number of different issues as, as being reasons for needing additional time. And you can see these aren't meant to be additive. Communities could select all of the things that they noted as being driving issues for them. And you can see that basically just 
getting the plan done or the development of individual plan components is the biggest item. They're just not quite finished with some components of their plans. And then related to that on the, the very bottom of the chart is just staff workload overall um, being another driving factor. I think this is really reflective of what we're seeing with the number of amendments that we've also been receiving. So staff are trying to update plans at the same time as reviewing um, project proposals and new amendments to their existing 2030 plans at the same time as trying to update 2040 plans. Um, so that's really contributing to some of that. Um, then you see just a smaller distribution of other issues. Um, contract planner being related to the staff workload piece, but public participation process and responding to that or responding to comments that they're getting on draft plans being another issue. And as I noted with amendments, the <coughs> other one about three quarters of the way down, the development or redevelopment that's in process is also taking away from staff time working on um, 2040 plan updates. So just a reminder of the preliminary review process that communities can do this through the end of September, submit their draft plans for review and council staff have been focusing feedback on completeness of the information in the plan and then um, red flags, um, any conformance issues and any policy inconsistencies up front. So we have time to work those out with the local governments before submitting their plans officially. So some emerging themes and things that we've seen so far in, in the 73 plans that we reviewed is that we really have had some really excellent mapping, which makes our jobs a lot easier when we can see what's happening in the community. We can see the level of detail that helps us to make a better determination as it relates to our systems and our policies. Um, and as I noted earlier, very few systems conformance issues. One thing that has uh, made my, my staff and I very happy is that we've seen many plans using all of those resources that we produce for them um, and created for them in the on their community pages in the local planning handbook, just pulling out those maps and using them directly in their plans. Um, solar resource mapping, for example, is one of the things that is a required element, but communities aren't even just adjusting it, they're just taking it and putting it in their plan and then building their policies and discussion around what that resource says about that community. So we're really happy to see that, that we're, what we're hoping is that that's facilitating both um, the development of their plan, but also help building a platform for better policy discussion locally. Um, we have seen a more widespread discussion regarding equity um, in plans, um, probably a little, um, well, definitely more than we saw it in the last cycle, which was pretty rare to even see it uh, discussed in plans, but we're seeing it more widespread across the metro. It's not concentrated in one type of community or another, and it's at varying levels. Um, some communities are just dipping their toes in the water and others are going uh, further, having uh, built off some past work that they've done. Um, we're seeing more communities incorporating work around uh, bicycle transportation network and connecting local bike plans to the regional network as well. Um, and as I noted, really including those solar resources and building stronger <laughs> policies around that work. Um, we've also seen some really strong plans working on sustainability and on climate action. Um, and not just in the core areas, we've seen this in some of our suburbs as well, um, really um, pushing that forward and putting in discrete actions and identifying roles and responsibilities within uh, staff departments on who is going to be doing what and taking on uh, what items within that work. And then of course, as I noted, equity and both vision statements and, and going further in that work. So this is just a high level picture of where we're at today in the planning process. Um, definitely have seen more plans than we saw in the last cycle at this point in the process. And I know we're, um, have a little bit of nervousness about the upcoming deadline about it because it's a lot a lot of work, but we're, we're up for the task and certainly we'll continue to track um, trends in the work that we're seeing and have set up some additional mechanisms <clears throat> to be able to report out after the full after the full planning process is complete and be able to say, this is what we saw in plan. So we're working on those um, structures to have those in place and to be able to track those as we're reviewing them because it's much easier than going back and rereading all the plans after the fact. So I'm happy to answer any questions should you have any. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Dorfman. Okay. So listening to you, thank you, Lisa, for that presentation and get, updating us. So. And this is the first time that I've been on the Met Council and gone through, well, it's probably for all of us, gone through comp plans, right? 
No. How many years ago was it? It's ever okay. Sorry. <laughs> you, oh, that's right. You, you've been here forever. <laughs> but so it's one of the more important things we do, um, and it's pretty technical. And obviously, you know, we've seen cities where um, various cities their comp planning is getting attention. Um, and so there are people showing up at various public meetings and expressing their view. But when people, I mean, it occurs to me that this is a story worth telling in terms of the value of a regional planning agency around this in going through comp planning this year, um, given that every year at the legislature there's more discussion about is, is there value to the Met Council or not. We should tell the story, and it's so... For most people, it's pretty technical, you know, listening to all of this. But the themes that are coming out of here, um, the reason we do this, the value to the cities, mm -hmm. the value for us as a region, it's a, it's a great story worth telling in a way that people would understand. Um, and so I hope we'll figure out a way, maybe toward the end of the year, to do that. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. Councilmember Dorfman, I think one of the values too that we can talk about is how much different the planning cycle and what comprehensive plans look like today as right. compared to yeah. the first plans in 78, the handful of plans in 88, and then what even what 98 looked like. Um, one of the things that, you know, I, I think I've mentioned to Chair Commerce and others a handful of times over the years, um, early plans were full of conformance issues and we were, as a as a governing body, we're regularly requiring plan modifications. Um, we've gotten to the point where we've been able to work with communities now where everyone knows where they stand and this is the regional system and this is what our expectations are. Where plan modifications are a rarity. They're quite uncommon, actually, and we didn't actually perform many modifications in the last planning cycle at all. But that's on one piece. And then on the other element that we're supposed to be, um, the purpose of comprehensive planning is around coordinated regional planning. That means where all the local governments have compatible plans with one another as well. And if you look back in the records for the 78 cycle and even the 98 cycle, there's a lot of discord between communities with plans that don't quite line up with one another and a lot of disagreement over what should happen along borders, things aren't quite lining up. That's pretty uncommon to see that type of incompatibility today. Um, those are some baseline values that I think we kind of take for granted in this region, but really do serve, uh, serve our region well to have connected and coordinated planning. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to expand on that. It's not just getting rid of those inconsistencies. Mm -hmm. We have huge savings in our regional infrastructure as a, as a result of that planning. There's a reason why our, our uh, wastewater rates are right. well below the national average. It's because our system is really efficient in putting the pipes where the users are going to be and vice versa mm -hmm. and planning well out so because there's a lot of places in the country that don't have any excess sewer capacity they can't take growth because they don't have the excess capacity our region is booming and we aren't finding any place where we have a shortfall of capacity right now for that growth because it's well planned mm -hmm. councilmember barber um thank you mr chair um also to follow on to Councilmember uh, Darkman's comments, I think it would be really good to go out after this process to some of the cities and so you can get cities of different sizes and, and, and um, uh, community designations because I've been to some of the sessions in some of these cities and they've been fantastic. I mean, they really are using this as an opportunity to look at what they want their city to be, how they want to grow, um, what how they can work together um, to have those connections across the region. Uh, I've seen um, in communities of different sizes really positive discussions and I really think this process is what's helping to foster some of that and I think that's something that you know we should be able to tie into this and get maybe some sort of testimonials from some of the cities who have had a really active um, discussion on difference. Yeah, well said. Lisa I have a question about um, I think it's really helpful to have the comparison of the last cycle to the current cycle in terms of requests for extensions. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad that we have a policy with some flexibility for communities <coughs> to react to local conditions. Um, but it seems like kind of an interesting comparison given that 2008 was 
um, a very different beast than this current year in a lot of ways. And when, you know, 25 or 30 percent of the communities are requesting extensions, to me, it does it does merit its own kind of dialogue about are there specific issues that are precluding, um, you know, communities <coughs> being able to move through to submittal in that current year? I think it's good to have the flexibility for extensions, but I just wonder if you have thoughts about are there patterns as far as things, you, you know, you've listed out these mm -hmm. 15 or so elements, but would you say there are sort of themes as far as what is keeping communities from meeting the December 2018 deadline? Uh, Mr. Chair, council members, the you know, I think a lot of it goes to what I was mentioning earlier about having more development now and responding to requests now at the time when they're trying to finish up and wrap up comprehensive plans. Um, I think we are also thinking back to where our um, communities were staffed previously and how communities are staffed today. Um, after the recession in 2008, 2009, and changes to LGA funding at that time as well. Um, a lot of staff uh, were let go from cities um, around the region, and not not every city has recovered or staffed up to the same degree where they had been in the past either. One of the other things I think that we're experiencing or around the cusp of experiencing in the region too is just a change in local planning staff where we, um, in the last several cycles, had Kind of staff who had grown up with the planning process now have retired and moved on and we have newer staff in many communities working on comprehensive plans for the first time and are new to in some ways new to their communities as compared to previous staff who maybe had been there for many years um, and so aren't coming with all of that um, sort of institutional knowledge about what's in the community and why they made decisions in the past and so trying to grapple with that at the same time uh, you're certainly right that we are the, the driving factors are definitely different. In 2008, a lot of communities were, you know, we were booming and then we busted really quick. Um, and that really caused communities to pause and say, if they hadn't submitted their plan to us already and say, maybe we should take a second and rethink what our, our forecast should look like and what our um, and what our plan should be as it relates to that. So we, if you look at kind of plans submitted early in the 2008 cycle and those submitted later, the early ones are very optimistic about growth and the later ones are less so. Um, so we, that and changing the funding really affected communities in the last cycle. And there was quite a bit of political turnover. Uh, local, lots of local city council members were up for re-election right around the time that plans were due as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we heard that being less of an issue in this cycle than we did 10 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councilor Dorfman. Um, two things. First, a question. So, what happens to cities who don't get their plans in in, time, in on time? Sure. Whether it's the extension or the December. Mr. Chair, Councilmember Dorfman, um, there isn't a thing that happens to communities, but um, things start to get a little bit more difficult for them the longer they wait. So, uh, so as you recall. Um, the council will no longer entertain amendments to 2030 comprehensive right. plans at, after December 31st of this year. Mm -hmm. um, so any community who's wanting to accommodate new development that isn't consistent with their 2030 plan and doesn't have an updated 2040 plan will just have to pause until they completed their 2040 plan in order to move forward since they can no longer amend their 2030. Sorry, that was a lot of numbers in that sentence. So I hope no, that I, is clear. I um, and then the further down the path you go, um, the later that plan gets, the more likely a community is to start to be ineligible for other funding requests. So for example, we will start the process um, and nego to negotiate affordable life cycle housing goals in 2020 for re-enrollment in the livable communities uh, program. Um, a community who hasn't submitted their plan yet may not be eligible to negotiate those goals, for example, because um, you'll have to have that baseline in place. Um, the further out you go, you may also risk, a community may risk not having certain uh, planned roadways or expansions or um, regional parks or trails um, identified in their 2030 plan that are in, their, that are in the 2040s 
regional system plan, if their current plans don't identify those, they may not be eligible to actually apply for or receive funding for those projects. So that gets a little ways out, but those are some potential things that um, the longer one community waits, the, the more difficult things can be for them. So, and the last comment, I think it's interesting that the, the counties took this more seriously this time around. And I know Hennepin, what, because I was involved in a little bit of what Hennepin was doing and meet and public meetings and discussions and staff that were specifically assigned, mm -hmm. much seemed much more than was done the last time around. Mr. Chair, Councilmember Dorfman, I don't know about the level of seriousness, but I will say that um, uh, that we have seen counties um, in this cycle um, use the planning process as a as a platform to be to kind of take on um, more broader community engagement and to look at other things. Certainly, in the past cycles, we've seen some counties really just focus on the required elements and not go beyond that, even where they may have areas of influence, like certain funding programs or um, certain other services that they provide that might relate to community development or have an influence in their community or in their jurisdiction. Um, I mean, I know we did see um, counties really try to be proactive about the transportation planning, and that mm -hmm. certainly was something that uh, cities were asking for as well, to kind of know what the county was going to do, and the county wanted to know what they were going to do. So working together on that was certainly on um, board this time. Mm -hmm. Councilman Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. just wanted to follow up on your previous question. Um, if you are a township and you don't have any funding that you're going to be looking for, you don't have any development, there's really not much of a of a stick for not mm -hmm. getting your, your plan in on time. One of my townships was a, a straggler in the last <laughs> bunch and they really have nothing going on, but so, just but, yeah. it gets to the point where staff is like, okay, we'll, we'll write it all up for you. you just <laughs> get it done because there is no right. real yeah. stick for someplace that's not developing. It's very, very important for the places that are experiencing growth, but mm -hmm. if you're if you don't have anything going on, it's not as risk. important of a process to the to the local community. Well, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Wolf, I think one thing though, I, we've seen townships be pushed a little more on um, in this cycle than previously is this demand to accommodate solar development within their areas. And that's really pushed them um, to address it and have policies associated with that because there have been uh, just a explosion of requests, especially in the rural areas around our region out, um, and outside our region as well, um, for solar gardens and other types of solar development. So even if there is not population households growth, there certainly is um, a, a different kind of pressure for development in, in those communities that uh, would cause the township to look a little, little more closely at their plans sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Chavez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, returning to slide eight, which is the bar graph about the planning issues cited, a couple of things caught my eye. I'm wondering if you're in a position now, it may be premature, to share any color or comments about the community designation and the density policy. Sure, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Chavez, you know, in the last cycle, we had a lot of communities in 2008 who really struggled with kind of meeting the required density for their communities and really were working on that and trying to figure out how to get to just three units an acre. That was the part where they were going back and forth quite a bit on. Um, in this cycle, we have a little less of that, or have a lot less of that, actually, um, mostly because communities have gotten, that, gotten to that level as part of the 2030 plans. Um, don't recall which communities had, had noted that density policy as being an issue um, in particular, but it was only a handful of them, um, only four in this cycle as compared to, I think, maybe 30 plus in the last cycle. Um, but it can be, it may be a combination of both um, planning for densities and accommodating um, natural resource protection at the same time and trying to figure out how to weigh those two together, I'd have to look a little more closely at what, which communities had cited that. So I can't say for sure. Um, 
there are to the community designation portion there are some communities who we thought were kind of on the edge of being in one designation or another and are kind of waiting through what that might look like because moving from one designation to another um, changes density expectations and changes some other um, policies associated with that change so um, while we don't necessarily, we're not pushing any particular community one way or other, it's a consideration that warrants a lot of conversation locally to decide where they'd like to be. Um, but uh, staff have been really uh, supportive and informative in those conversations to help make sure that local governments and staff have the information they need to understand what the ramifications of a change would be. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other comments, discussion? Thank you for the update. I think this will be a good thread for us to continue to um, discuss as the year concludes and as we start the, the next. Thank you. Thank you. Obviously, we're gonna be very busy with the plans that are submitted as well as the ones that, that aren't. Uh, Paul Burns is our next um, presenter, Livable Communities Overview video. Good afternoon, Paul. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think Ms. Barajas has a few. Uh, introductory comments first. Okay. I do. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Paul. Um, so staff have been working. Um, this has been a joint effort with our communication staff and Paul and Carol Critchley have been working over the um, last several months on these, on these videos that Paul will be showing to you. Kind of the goal was to show that was to actually show the impacts of livable communities grants. We talk about them all the time, but we wanted to be able to both show the impacts of the program, but also to show um, what the different projects look like. It's just have some inspirational value for potential applicants in the future. Um, as the livable communities program is, is, it's a demonstration account. It's meant to really um, inspire new ways of building our communities that are more livable and so there's some tenants associated with it but when you just read the words it's not the same as actually seeing it happen on the ground so um, a lot of work has gone into these and i will give paul some uh paul will walk through what it looks like on our website but I'd really like to thank chair of commerce for um, pushing staff to think about how we use different media to um, promote this program and to promote the projects that have come out of this program. So thank you, uh, Chair, and Pleasure. I don't have any additional comments. I turn it to Paul. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I think you, you all see these projects come through as concepts and site plans and renderings, and uh, I think Chair Commerce uh, thought it'd be a good idea. Uh, I think you wanted the overview mm -hmm. level and to, to not only show ourselves, but show uh, the, the region and, and the communities in the region, what the Livable Communities Program has accomplished. And it does that at, at an overview level, as well as I just want to show that um, down below here, uh, Carol Critchley, uh, Ms. Critchley did some individual projects, videos of individual projects. And that kind of feeds into some of the things we've been trying to do as staff. Um, uh, by uh, every year we try to improve the, the website in terms of helping applicants understand what we mean by uh, what's a good cleanup project, what are we trying to accomplish, what's the affordable housing uh, process going through Minnesota housing. And then as Lisa talked about the demonstration project, that seems to be the account that people have the biggest, the hardest time grasping the, 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 the broader goal rather than simply filling the funding gap in projects, but helping to try to create better uh, neighborhoods that are, that are mutually supportive of one another. And then furthermore, the TOD, the transit-oriented development, what is the transit-oriented development beyond something that just happens to be near a <coughs> transit station? So some of these uh, videos really help enhance the work that we've been trying to do. And if you look at this, um, you can see where my pointer is right now, um, this takes you to a site, I hope, that uh, we have some static profiles of s some of these projects. Apparently it's not going there. Oh, there we go. Um, these are, um, this is a page that you go to to, to uh, connect with in other individual projects that we've selected as good examples of, of things to help 
prospective applicants uh, get an idea of what we're what we're looking for and what ha what worked in that setting doesn't necessarily mean you have to replicate that but um, get you thinking about whether what you can do in your own site uh, or your own community to to um, do something similar and I'm sure you all know how to navigate our website quite well, but uh, if you're trying to tell somebody where to find these on our website, you know, from the main council website, you go to communities, select livable communities. That'll bring you to our main livable communities website. And if you go up here on the right hand, upper right hand side, the static profiles is here, and then these new videos is, uh, is that link. So I'll just show you the, uh, the overview. And I think you'll recognize at least one of the voices. One, on two, three. Video. Hey. Thirty years ago, it didn't look like the downtown would make it, but now we have a thriving community with people coming to the area all day long for restaurants, for shopping, for living, for working, to enjoy nature, and if the Met Council and other partners weren't involved in that, it just wouldn't happen. It takes a vision in order to keep a thriving downtown area. This would not have happened by the efforts of a neighborhood, by a vision of a a few uh, design uh, visionaries. This really took the infrastructure, the big scale, the district level thinking of the council to make this happen, what we're seeing today. There will be a lot of jobs here, there will be people living here, there will be people staying here and working here, and, and really it'll activate the riverfront itself, especially. There's going to be nothing else like it. For our community to have a place for their older, for their parents and their grandparents to go to be safe and to be comfortable, and to to feel a part of a community of people that their own peers is very important. in the power of place, the power of culture, the power of partnership, and a commitment to doing more than just building things, to actually engaging community uh, in the work. Thank you very much. I think that's uh, just an outstanding outcome. I really kind of struck by what a successful conveying of that story uh, it, it really is just in that one of multiple um, segments that are produced here. So I'm 
But if you look at these individual, Mr. Chair, if you look at these mm -hmm. individual projects, um, uh, there are uh, testimonials from some of the communities that that received the grants, and and uh, I think you saw one of the folders <coughs> in in the overview, and uh, uh, none of it was stuff we scripted. Uh, Ms. Critchley did a, I thought, a fabulous job of uh, doing the videos and then asking the right questions to get really really good. Uh, comments from the grantees. Mm -hmm. I had a recent um, experience that is consistent with past experience where uh, when I describe this group of programs to people who are not from the region, who do not have familiarity with it, they're uh, pretty universally struck and, uh, and, and really impressed and frankly envious about it. Um, this person was from uh, the greater Toronto area and was completely uh, just really impressed by the fact that this group of programs have been created and continue to be, um, you know, sustained and developed and refined over time. And I think these kinds of tools can just be such an effective way to reach stakeholders in the region, you know, statewide and, and more broadly about what is a really incredibly successful story so really really pleased come from Dorfman um, yeah this is great thank you I'm I'm only a little hurt that Excelsior and Grand isn't there <laughs> maybe later you can <laughs> go back to some of the first projects and... I have <laughs> right. I know <laughs> anyway I think this is great so I may have missed it the one thing I want on the site is and I think you do it pretty well on jobs um, I want to know the number of affordable housing units or housing units in general and then affordable that have come up through livable communities. You have a little bit of it, but not the whole number. Um, and it's a, it's a significant number. So it's listed under, you know, one section, but I'm, and I may have missed it. Uh, Mr. Chair, Council Member Dorfman. We, I think we do have a profile of Excelsior and Grant, and I just met do with you the really? communications okay. staff. <laughs> and they're, they're talked about going back to some of the original, like Excelsior and Grant and part of the city. Minnetonka, I think, had, was the first. Ones we thought we had kind of overdone, you know, time after time after time, we point to those as examples, and we thought we'd get some. Newer ones. No, I'm I'm being I'm kidding you a little bit. But to, to your point, um, that's a member. It's only because I spent six years of my life on that project. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a fact sheet that we try to keep updating every year. And yeah, I don't. I, well, so I found some affordable housing numbers under the, I always forget what LHIA stands for. Yeah, Local Housing Incentive. So <coughs> it's there, but that doesn't capture the demonstration project. Uh, Mr. Chair, Council Member Dorfman, we, this has a, a been an ongoing struggle since I've gotten here, the, trying to come up with defensible, good numbers, because mm -hmm. in the early years of the program, the, the, that information wasn't <coughs> up really consistently. And then we have many grants that, had, or many projects that have two, three, or even four separate grant awards. So we're right. trying to sift through all yeah. the double and triple and quadruple counting to, um, to get a better handle on those numbers. So we, uh, the affordable numbers, I think, are harder to get. I mean, it'd be nice even to have just the number of housing units. I mean, I know Excelsior and Grant did not have as many affordable units as some of us would have liked, but it generated, I think, over 700. In fact, and it's grown even more now, so. Thanks. Other comments? Councilman Ramon. Mr. Chair, I really like the videos. I, I think the pictures truly tell the story. One of the things that I always wished we had for livable communities was before and after shots before Excelsior and Grant compared to the thriving um, TOD that it is today. Um, and I also really appreciate that we interviewed people who directly benefit from uh, who live in housing developments, who work at the new jobs. Um, I think that's as important as having a developer or the, the city planner give you a testimonial. 
Mr. Chair, uh, Council Member Munt, thank you very much. This is one of the profiles, the static profiles that we've done, and it, it does show a before and after shot of the, uh, the art space project in, uh -huh. in uh, Hastings. And uh, for the most part, those um, profiles do that. And that property was vacant for more than 30 years. Hmm. Well, Mr. Chair, even going back to when I was city planner there. <laughs> 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 and and that other that other building that you saw in the video was a Hudson Sprayer manufacturing mm -hmm. building, and the mayor at the time I started in Hastings worked at, in that building. Mm. That's great. Mm. This is outstanding, and uh, I just want to suggest all the council members. Um, you know, I think we should we should uh, do our part to share this with our our network, social media wise and otherwise. Um, Tremendous work. Thank you very much for the Mr. Chair, I think to look you at should it. also congratulate yourselves to see uh, what you've helped contribute towards. Great. Thank you very much, Paul. Members, our last uh, information item is um, an information item on the 2018 Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund bonding. Um, Mayor Robeson is going to present on, I think, uh, um, an emerging, uh, I think, policy issue that's pretty significant and is kind of the creature of the way that some decisions were made at the recent legislative session. So look forward to our discussion. Thank you. That's Welcome. quite a good introduction. Can you hear me all right? Okay. Yes. I'm not used to this, so forgive me. Uh, Mary Robeson, budget manager. Uh, here as council member commerce as chair commerce said to discuss regional bonding and specifically a bonding appropriation that the council received uh, this last session so just a brief background the environment and natural resources trust fund which i'll be referring to as the trust fund but is also sometimes called enrtf is a constitutionally designated fund using lottery revenue to for the protection conservation preservation and enhancement of the state's air, water, land, fish, wildlife, and other natural resources. The trust fund is used for a variety of environmental programming statewide, research, and natural resource land acquisition. The council historically has received funding for, from this fund for acquisition into the regional park system. In 2018, the legislature created a new bonding authority as part of the bonding bill uh, to, to bond out of this fund for the first time which creates a new funding source for the state and the council. Minnesota Management and Budget, or MMB, will be issuing these bonds for the first time in October or November, at which point the funding will become available. There were uh, 98 million in appropriations from these trust fund bonds going to the environmental agencies of the state, the Met Council, and the Public Facilities Authority. The Met Council's appropriation was for $10 million, and this is as follows. For improvements and betterments of a capital nature and acquisition by the council and local government units of regional recreational open space lands in accordance with the council's policy plan. As I said in the past, the council has historically received this funding for acquisition, but this is more along the lines of what we would typically receive um, from state geo bonds. In cases like this, the funding is split amongst the 10 park agencies according to a formula in the policy plan. Just wanted to note that this appropriation was not in the um, governor's original bonding bill, but was added um, later on to the bonding bill as part of discussions with the park between the park agencies and the legislature. The law is pretty clear on the intent of these funds in terms of it addresses that the legislature firmly believed that the bonding authority created and the appropriations therein were in line with the constitutional requirements of the fund and consistent uh, with the overall purpose of the Environmental Trust Fund. So just wanted to point out some of those language examples. So within that context, the council has a policy decision to make uh, related to the matching of trust fund bonds. 
The council's policy is currently to match every $3 of state geo bonds for regional parks with $2 of regional bonds. Because this is a new funding source, we do not have a policy around this right now. So the question is, should the council mirror the policy of matching state geo bonds with a matching of this trust fund bond appropriation? The positives of matching the funding are in this particular case for this particular appropriation that it is in line with legislative intent that it is consistent with our policy to match geo bonds and that of course it supports the park agencies in moving forward with their capital projects as they proposed during the legislative session in which they assumed matching dollars from the council similar to the geo bond matching policy it's also consistent with the council's cip or capital budget for parks which assumes a match to an annual $10 million appropriation from the state. In this case, again, the, the pot of money is changing, but the overall assumption of a 10 million state appropriation is part of our capital plan. And the initial analysis indicates that we do have the dollars available under the current levy. The cons of matching would be that over time, um, were this to become a, a broader policy, any bonding that goes on, of course, puts pressure against the general levy and the, the cap that we currently have of 2%. And it also uh, validates what some environmental groups view as a bad precedent for the use of trust fund uh, dollars. Can you explain that just a little bit more? Sure. Um, Chair Commerce, Councilmember Dorfman, there have been some environmental groups that have expressed concern about the creation of a bonding authority out of the trust fund because it potentially takes up space in the trust fund for debt service and other things that would otherwise go to environmental programs. Okay. Staff's recommendation at this time is that the council match this specific $10 million appropriation from the trust fund with $6.6 .6 million in regional bonds as consistent with the council's match for GO bonds. In terms of next steps on considering this recommendation, we're not asking you for action today. This is just an information item. We're planning to bring this back to you on August 20th for pot potential action. If approved for a match, this the match itself would be reflected in the third quarter budget amendment. At this time, we're not, this recommendation doesn't include a larger policy around bonding and matching for the trust fund ongoing. We don't know what the future of this funding source is going to be. We also know that the policy of matching $3 to $2 needs to be re-examined um, we need to take a look at our bonding practices for parks and the staff plan to do this in the coming months. And at that time, we'll be able to come back to you with a broader policy on bonding for parks that would include this just as part of that. That's, that concludes my presentation. So I Okay, thank you very much. Council Member Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Was there anything that has come up that would be eligible for geo bond being passed through to the agencies that's not eligible under the new CNRTF money? Sure. The council, um, excuse me, council member, chair of commerce, council member, well, I'm getting used to that. Uh, the projects that the agencies proposed as part of their work towards this appropriation were things, infrastructure projects that one would normally see for geo bonds, such as um, paving of trails, uh, parking lot improvements, visitor center repairs. So the, the full list up to the 16.6 .6 million is really consistent with those types of uses. Um, that's not something that we would typically pay for out of environmental trust. Again, the council's only done natural resource land acquisition with trust fund dollars, um, but it would not typically be seen as well. Councilmember Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But 
is there anything in that language that prohibits us from passing that money on? No. To, I mean, I, I don't agree with what the legislature did, but better to have weird money than no money for the, the parks agencies. And, and personally, I think we should match. I, I'm not real excited about doing a policy amendment to say we'll always match because I don't want to encourage them to do that weird money in the future. But I think the right thing to do for the agencies is for us to, to match because it's not their fault that they played That's these true. little things in the end. Mr. Chair, Council Member Wolf, there's nothing that prohibits us from matching. Um, the appropriation does state in accordance with the policy plan, which could arguably be viewed as an argument for matching since we match in the policy plan for GEO bonds. I also would want to note that some of the park agencies are looking exclusively for uh, reimbursement for prior acquisition. And we do that exclusively out of regional bonds. We do not use state bonds for reimbursement of prior acquisition, which means that if we chose not to match, there would be some agencies that would um, not be able to receive that reimbursement. I, my response initially when I, um, you know, became um, aware of, of this information was essentially, Council, Council Member Wolf, what you just described, that there's really two separate dynamics here. One is a legislative decision that we may each have opinions about. My feeling is it seems like quite anomalous to the way that this work has been done in the past, which has been really successful and effective. I'm not sure why we're, the legislature would choose to borrow against lottery revenue in that way, but that's separate from the decision that's sort of at our table, which is, you know, how do we go about considering a match? And my sense is that this recommendation reflects kind of the best practice of what we've done in the past, and that's been a successful way to partner with our constituents and the implementing agencies. Um, I do have concerns about, you know, what, what the future will look like, uh, depending on, you know, who is in a position to drive that agenda of the legislature next year. Um, but this seems to be a, an, an effective way to kind of manage our responsibilities at the same time that we may have opinions about the way the legislature is going about theirs. Mary, I wonder, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the discussion about uh, what kinds of, um, of bonds might be issued by the state for this particular purpose? Does that have uh, relevance in your view to the decision that we'll need to make on this? Mr. Chair, uh, I believe you're referring to that these bonds will be taxable bonds rather than tax-exempt bonds. Mm -hmm. um, what that does mean is that many federal regulations related to tax-exempt bonds do not apply. In terms of whether or not that reflects on the matching decision, I believe it may impact what agencies want to fund out of this pot of money. I don't see a connection to the matching decision itself. Mm -hmm. And can you remind me too, in terms of time frame for uh, the next steps that are, are bulleted there? Thank you, Mr. Chair, sure. excellent question. So as stated, MMB will be selling these bonds in October or November, at which point these funds would become available for spending. As these are funds that are coming from the trust fund, they are also governed by LCCMR, the Legislative Citizen Commission for Minnesota Resources. And the LCCMR has asked for work plans and presentations on these projects. The work plans are due later this month in August for LCCMR staff review. And then they have asked the council to please present them on September 13th. So we are working towards um, those deadlines in line with LCCMR's process. And we will hopefully have a decision 
on this matching issue on August 20th, which would allow us to know the final budgets of the projects and the final work plans prior to the September 13th presentation. Thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. Councilman Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to uh, bring up one other facet of this that occurred to me. Um, there's always a tension between agencies looking for earmarks for their projects rather than advocating for money for the pool for all of the agencies. And earmarks don't get matched. It, whatever you get is what you get. And sometimes they're substantial. Sometimes they're larger than the entire regional parks budget. Um, but I think it's important for us to match this to show that we actually care about the regional system and not encourage people to go outside for earmarks because there is no match of that. It's less money for the, the region if you, if you don't play together, basically. I think you make a very good point. You've raised that on a couple of occasions, and I think that's a really good point. Councilman Ramon? Mr. Chair, Mary, when staff made this recommendation, did you consider other demands on our bonding authority? Mr. Chair, Council Member Munt, yes, that was part of the decision here, and I certainly think that's part of the long, longer term discussion that we have about the parks bonding future and the decision to match trust fund bonds ongoing. In the discussion that we had about this particular recommendation, it was driven in large part by concerns about following legislative intent, as well as the knowledge that we do have this programmed in our capital budget. And as indicated, our initial analysis indicates we have it available under the current levy. But that's the tension in this short-term recommendation versus a longer-term policy discussion that we'll be having in months to come. Other questions, members? Okay, thank you very much for this background and you've got a lot to think about. Uh, well, that concludes our agenda. Members, I wanted to suggest that um, for our business items, the Minneapolis amendment is a same week item, so that will go on the business agenda. I wanted to suggest also <laughs> that the City of Plymouth comprehensive plan amendment also goes on the council's business um, agenda rather than consent, just to continue to um, elevate the uh, importance of that work. So uh, with that, I think we'll be adjourned unless there's any new business.